Uh, hello, everyone. How are you? This is Audi from Resolve Medical. Welcome you all, new and older friends, to join the global webinar. Resonic Dental is a free online platform for the purpose of sharing the cutting edge know-how and the insights of point of care ultrasound applications with global professionals and medical practitioners. Today, we are much honored to invite Professor Salman from Iraq as our webinar speaker to share his valuable experience of ultrasound guided interventional management in patients with cancer pain. Meanwhile, we are also much honored to invite Dr. Raaf as our webinar moderator. Today's webinar will be divided into two major parts. The first part is the lecture by Professor Salman and the second part is the QA, Q&A session. So welcome you all to raise your questions and further communicate with Professor Salman during Q&A session. Now, please allow me to give you a brief introduction of our webinar moderator, Dr. Raad. Uh, Dr. Raad Kafaji. He is the current consultant assistant professor and the chief of the Department of IC Management at the Arkadisia Medical College, Iraq. He is the vice chair in Middle East session, section of World Institute of Pain. He is the secretary general of the Iraqi Society of Pain Management. He is the faculty and examiner of Iraqi Board in Pain Management. Is the membership of Difficult Airway Society of the United Kingdom. Is the membership of Egyptian Society for Anesthesia Intensive Care and the Pain Management. Is the membership of European Resuscitation Council. He published several researches successively at British Journal of Anesthesia and the Arcadia Medical Journal from 2006 to 2019, such as Ketamine in anesthetic practice, subcostal TAP block as analgesia for post op pain in open cholecystectomy, perineal nerve block as analgesia for post op pain in AP repair of the vagina, and so on. So let's welcome Dr. Raat. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Odi, for this nice presentation. And many thanks to Wisonic for these active, actively teaching ultrasound guided webinars for pain management. It is an opportunity to teach and to learn and to meet with the friends from around the globe. Uh, our gratitude to, to Wisonic and to Mr. Odi especially. Okay, thank you, Dr. I introduce my friend and my brother, Professor Ayad Abbas Salman. He is the professor of College of Medicine, University of Baghdad, Iraq. It is difficult for me to introduce such a person with enormous uh, activities and experiences. He is consultant of anesthesiologist at Medical City Hospital Baghdad is the chairman of the Scientific Council of Anesthesia and Intensive Care in the, board for, in the Iraqi Board for Medical Specialization from 2014 till now. He is the chairman of Scientific Committee of Pain Medicine Fellowship in Iraq in the Iraqi Board for Medical Specialization and is the chairman of the Training Committee in the Arabic Board for medical specialization in 2015. He is the faculty member of the British Anesthesia and Pain Academy. He is faculty member of the, what is called NISORA, New York of March 2018. He is the organizer and actively taking part as an instructor in ultrasound guided, basic, intermediate and advanced courses in Iraq in tilted ultrasound guided important skills in pain management 
uh, now he is training uh, some colleagues from Iraq as the second course in two months. While I know Professor Ayad since more than 20 years, he is very keen, eager to learn and eager to teach. He is very humble, very humble, quiet person, despite enormous responsibilities. He is the founder of the Iraqi Fellowship for International Pain Management, a three years study teaching both ultrasound guided and fluoroscopic guided interventions. It's my honor and pleasure always to work with him to raise the standards of pain management in Iraq, and it is an honor and pleasure to be with him today. Professor Ayad, you may start, please. Yes, welcome, Professor. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Raad, for a uh, very nice introduction. It's honestly my honor and my pleasure to be introduced from such a qu highly qualified and skillful person, and uh, more than that, better than that, honest person from like you. Uh, my deep thanks to the Wisonic Dandling College for this opportunity to talk about very important topic for me and for all the people all over the world. Many thanks to Mr. Odi, who uh, really uh, did very hard work to achieve such activity. Thank you. Uh, uh, I have to greet all the attendants and participants in this activity, and I hope to introduce and present a presentation may be uh, beneficial for all of us, all of us uh, apart from the society and uh, unfortunately now the cancer pain increase in the number all over the world. Let me share my presentation. Everything is okay? Yes, it's okay. Good. Okay, starting from the title, really I'm so happy from the title for two reasons. First, to talk about cancer pain, which is uh, for me very essential topic to be talked about and to highlight the, this topic for all the uh, physician to uh, did more for the patients suffering from cancer pain. The second reason for my happiness is to talk about the ultrasound per se, ultrasound guided interventions. It is the field of interest for me to talk about. And before we starting the topic, I have to highlight the magnitude of the cancer pain. According to the World Health Organization, estimates that at 2021, there are 15 million new cases of cancer worldwide. As a new treatment increase survival rate, cancer patients will live longer with pain from the disease and its treatment. And this is logic. When we increase the years of survival, sure there will be an increase the suffering from pain for the patient actually suffering from CA. And pain is commonly associated with the cancer at certain levels or stage during the journey of the cancer in the body of the patient. Up to 25% of cancer pain is due to therapy and management itself that many modalities of the therapy may themselves triggering to 85% of persons with advanced cancer report severe and persistent pain that undermine health related quality of life. And about 25% of cancer patients with a survival of month or less 
have a moderate to severe pain. Slightly more than 20% of patients dying within 48 hours experience an increase in pain. And this is very important point that we increase the survival rate of the patient, increase the years to be survived, but it is not more important than the quality of life, the quality of survival. If the patient survived, live but with pain, he wished to be died rather than the survival with pain because it would be very poor quality of survival. The cancer pain actually of many types. First, uh, nociceptive, and is it, thought, it is thought to be due to sustained tissue injury and can be further classified as somatic and visceral. You know the CA itself with the growth and the metastasis produce more injury and this injury may affect many nearby and maybe far tissues that producing injury, this injury producing a nociceptive type of pain. And also with the time there will be in addition to nociceptive pain, neuropathic pain, which is due to injury caused by cancer that can subsequently lead to, to be aberrant processing of the somatosensory system, which is known as central and peripheral sensitization. Both of them add more complexity regarding the management of pain. So the pain may present in a mixed type of both types, nociceptive and neuropathic. And also it is a complex from uh, several aspects of a view. First, it's multidimensional. When we talk about, for example, trigeminal neuralgia, it is a single dimension pain affecting the trigeminal nerve. But we, when we talk about the cancer pain, it is multidimensional. If the patient, for example, complain of CA pancreas, this is a one direction, and this pain may be transmitted to the spine, added another dimension of nociceptive due to metastasis, and may affect the lung, and this added also another dimension. So it is a multidimensional. And multifactorial due to different area affected by the uh, original cancer. Multi-sites, different sites, in the same time may be affected by the pain. And it is also of mixed quality as we have just enumerated the different types of pain. We have a modality of the uh, management which is known to be neurolytic blocks of sympathetic access. Actually, neurolytic blocks of sympathetic access are effective in controlling visceral cancer pain and should be considered as an important adjunct to the pharmacological therapy for relief of severe visceral pain. And the goal of this neurolytic block of sympathetic access actually uh, these are two goals. First, to maximize the analgesic effect of opioid or non-opioid analgesic effect. And the second goal is to reduce the dosage of this agent to alleviate side effect. You know, most of the analgesics have different hazardous side effects. For example, if we talk about opioid, there will be sedation, there will be addiction, intolerance, and many other side effects you know. And uh, in this presentation, I will highlight different maneuvers related to the, the celiac ganglion block, uh, important block responsible for the uh, uh, block of the uh, pain that is originated from mainly, mainly upper abdominal pain. We have to know at first the anatomy of celiac plexus. 
It's about a three centimeter, three to four centimeter in size. It consists of the ciliac ganglia with a network of interconnecting fibers. So it is not a ganglia. These are several ganglia, five to seven ganglia, connected by interneurons. So it is a plexus rather than the ganglia or single nerve. And if you look at this image, you will find that this is the L1 vertebrae, and in front of L1, this is the aorta, and surrounding the aorta, these are in the yellow color structures, the tissue of celiac plexus, our target to be blocked. Typically, uh, sometimes the, these, this uh, plexus actually can be blocked by a, a chemical neurolysis, and we have different chemical neurolysis. The two famous chemical neurolytic agents are the uh, phenol and alcohol. The supply of this plexus attained from three nerves bilaterally. First one, greater splanchnic nerve. This is the greater splanchnic nerve. Second, lesser splanchnic nerve. And third, the least splanchnic nerve. These are six nerves, three on each side, targeting the celiac plexus surrounding the celiac trunk, which is the first branch from the abdominal aorta. Actually, it is uh, originated from the spinal cord through the sympathetic chain without synapses to the collateral ganglia, which is the celiac ganglia. What are the indications of this neurolysis? Actually, we have uh, indication for both malignant and non-malignant. But 98% of patients to be blocked are of malignant origin of pain. But this pain has to be chronic pain and severe pain. And the pain following the upper abdominal organs, which are sympathetically supplied by the celiac plexus. These organs or structures are liver, gallbladder, spleen, pancreas, and kidney, stomach, small bowel, and the proximal two-thirds of large bowel. So we have long list of the indication for the celiac neurolysis. This is why this maneuver is quite common in our pain management department. We have several approaches to block celiac plexus. These approaches are anti and from the name of anti means the neurolytic agent injected anterior to the crura, which is a structure related to diaphragm. retro means the injection of a neurolytic agent posterior to the crura. And these are, I mean, these two approaches are the most commonly performed technique in the uh, hospitals, we have other techniques, trans aortic approach, trans discal approach, and anterior approach. And to block the celiac plexus, we have a different guidance, radiological guidance. First, fluoroscopic CR, CT, ultrasound guided, MRI guided, and endoscopic guidance. We have to prepare the patient before the maneuver. Why? Because there may be some complications if we don't prepare the patient in a suitable, accurate way. And we have to stand for CBC, for white BC count and platelet count, because some patients underwent chemotherapy and the decrease of white BC may trigger infection and the decrease of platelet may help in the bleeding tendency. 
abdominal CT or MRI to recognize the anatomical distortion due to the disease itself. And we have to prepare by insertion of IV line and preload the patient with 500 ml normal saline to prevent the associated hypotension due to sympathetic blockade. The sedation during procedure is important, but not deep sedation. It is uh, just mild sedation to keep contact with the patient throughout the procedure. We have the, uh, our focus today to uh, concentrate on the anterior approach under ultrasound. But to give you a, an opportunity to compare advantages and disadvantages, I will just talk small slide, uh, few slides about the fluoroscopic guidance without the, uh, talking about the details. This is the posterior approach, means that the patient in a prone position and a fluoroscopic guided, we have to introduce two needles. This is one and this is the second and the target of these needles anterior to the body of L1. If you look at these two pictures, this is the tip. Of, these are the tips of needles, two needles. This is one and this is two. And both of them anterior to the body of vertebrae in the lateral view. And here the needles anterior to the anterolateral aspect of the L1. This is L1 and this is uh, T12. So here, there is a confirmation of the needle uh, position through the uh, fluoroscopy guidance. The best and easier position for fluoroscopy guidance is the prone position. But sometimes you can imagine the patient with abdominal pain, this abdominal pain prevents him or her from being lying in a prone position. And in another time, the patient may present it with big abdominal mass or swelling due to ascites. In both these conditions, the patient cannot lie prone, and this is an advantage for the ultrasound-guided uh, celiac neuralysis. If we don't know the technique of ultrasound-guided neuralysis, we have to do this technique, the technique, new technique in this situation, which is either of these two techniques, uh, knee chest position and lateral position, which is a, a bit difficult. Both of them are a bit at difficulty to the maneuver. This is an example, maybe at 2009, at that time, I there was no uh, rule of the ultrasound guided celiac plexus. So this the patient presented with ascites, cannot lie prone. So I was forced to do this procedure in a knee chest position. This patient on her knee and we put a pillow be, uh, below her chest. We have to confirm the tip of needles, this is by injection of a conus thrust, and the consults should be in longitudinal separate like that in the lateral view, and this is in the AP view. We have to inject local anesthetic, maximally 10 to 20 mil on each side, because we have two sides here, but not in single bullets and multiple uh, bulluses in each one, three to five mil, looking for the response from the patient. And if the local anesthetic produce an analgesic effect, can be followed by neurolytic block with alcohol or phenol, alcohol used by 70 to 100 percent in and, uh, severe complications. The mild complications are hypotension, diarrhea, bleeding due to uh, injury to the aorta or inferior vena cava, both of them nearby the celiac plexus. And sometimes 
this injury or the injection inside the vessel can uh, be prevented by using of the uh, cone thrust injection to be seen before the injection of the chemical neurolytic agent. Also, many injuries can be occur to the nearby structures, kidneys, ureter, lung, and pleura, uh, upper abdominal organ puncture with abscess or cyst formation, even can affect the sexual uh, activity of the, uh, of the male patient because of the uh, injection solution separate to the sympathetic chain bilaterally and sometimes can produce intramuscular injection to the nearby psoas muscle. The most sophisticated complication related to the celiac plexus block is the paraplegia. It is from its name, horrible complication. And this can be uh, occur due to injecting the neurolytic agent into the arteries that supply the spinal cord and this can be prevented by checking the needle position with radio or peak dye. Also, the lumbar nerve root irritation can be occurred after the injection due to a backward spread of the solution, and this can be occurred due to anatomical distortion due to the malignancy itself. And don't surprise that this maneuver itself can increase the pain due to alcohol itself because it is a rotating agent and can produce transient pain. Contraindication for this intervention, patient refusal, bleeding and infection risk in the presence of large aortic aneurysm where the source of pain is no longer being transmitted through autonomic nerve. Now, uh, we are talking about the anterior ultrasound guided approach. The advantages of this approach, it is really the true anticrural approach. The needle tip location in anterior side of the aorta at exact position of the celiac plexus. And it is more suitable for the patient who cannot lie prone because of the abdominal pain or other reasons like the ascites and uh, no radiation exposure compared to fluoroscopy or CT guidance. More suitable for the term terminal cancer patient that cannot be transferred to the radiology suite or the theater. The ultrasound machine is portable and the blow can be performed with adequate monitoring in a regular procedure room. Also, there is avoidance of the injury to the nerve root and neuroaxial structures during needle placement with the posterior approach. Decreasing or even eliminating the potential risk of paraplegia with the neurolytic celiac plexus block Paraplegia and serious neurological morbidity have been reported after celiac neurolysis. Paraplegia now has been reported with essentially every posterior approach to celiac and supplanting nerve techniques, except blocked by the anterior percutaneous approach. But honestly speaking, still the risk of major radicular artery spasm is present even with anterior approach, but it, but it is so rare and negligible. In the ultrasound guided anterior approach, as you see in this image, the ultrasound probe uses a curvilinear uh, of, uh, in the short axis, in the short axis, near, starting near the Zephos aorta, and the L1 vertebrae. We can get a benefit of the color Doppler to identify the celiac trunk, which is the first branch arising from the aorta below the diaphragm. And it's extended anteriorly 
and after the branching of this trunk, it will give further three branches, just like a fountain. The transducer was traced downward until the seagull sign was seen. Seagull sign, I will show you in the next slide. Also, the celiac trunk could have the appearance of a chauffeur or ram's horn. This is the seagull bear, as you see, and this is the sign with the uh, flying uh, seagull. And if we look at this ultrasonic image, this is the abdominal aorta, and this is the celiac trunk, and these are the branches of the celiac trunk and the celiac plexus surrounding the celiac trunk. So after appearance of this sign, we can insert the needle and to inject the chemical neurolytic agent around the celiac trunk under direct vision of the ultrasound. This is another uh, photos to show the chauffeur or ram's horn sign or seagull signs. And we have to know that the inferior vena cava also near the aorta and more deeper is the L1 uh, body of the vertebrae. We can get a benefit of the Doppler to see the seagull sign according to this image. Here in longitudinal, longitudinal axis of the ultrasound, we can see the aorta in the longitudinal way, and this is in short axis, just like a, a circle. This is the site of needle in the anterior approach, approaching the body of vertebrae, reaching the uh, celiac trunk, the first branch of the aorta. And the direction of the needle may be from the right side, and in this situation, we call it transhepatic in insertion of needle from the right side. And also, this is the needle, and this is the trunk. And also can be from the left side, and in this situation, we call it transgastric because the needle passes through the uh, stomach towards the celiac trunk. And also, we can use both types of the insertion of needle in a plane or out of a plane, but actually in a plane safer and easier and can be easily done but in certain situations that the uh, physician cannot insert the needle in the in-plane technique, for example, due to uh, growth of the tumor or the in, uh, anomaly of the uh, related vessels, we can insert it in out-of-plane technique. Now we're gonna talk about uh, the second topic, which is another type of the sympathetic blockade superior hypogastric plexus block. The anatomy related to this plexus that it is located anterior to L5-S1 interspace between the promontory of the sacrum and the bifurcation of the aorta. I mean the bifurcation into two its main branches that named as common iliac arteries in the uh, retroperitoneal space. The ureters are just lateral to the superior hypogastric. It, it's the continuation of celiac plexus and lumbar sympathetic chain. The hypogastric nerve are formed by the separation of fibers in the superior hypogastric plexus into the inferior hypogastric plexus. The inferior hypogastric plexus cannot be blocked because it's embedded within the pelvis but this plexus can be blocked indirectly by the blocking of superior hypogastric. The inferior hypogastric plexus descend on each side 
to the pelvic wall innervating the pelvic viscera. This is the L5 and this is the L S1. And in front of this interspace, the superior hypogastric plexus. And this plexus produced two nerves, left and right hypogastric nerve, supplying the inferior hypogastric plexus. This is the aorta, and these are the two common iliac arteries, and in between the superior hypogastric plexus, and uh, this is the uh, two hypogastric nerves supplying the inferior hypogastric plexus. What are the indications of the superior hypogastric plexus block? Mainly for pain originated from the pelvic organs. And these are bladder, proximal urethra, uterus, proximal vagina, prostate, rectum, and descending colon. These are the structures for which we can block the superior hypogastric pain, uh, superior hypogastric plexus to alleviate pain originated from these structures. And uh, keep in your mind the proximal vagina and the proximal urethra because the distal third of vagina and urethra uh, responsible by the ganglion impar that we will talk about in the uh, next topic. The contraindications of superior hypogastric, local or systemic infection, coagulopathy, anatomical variation in the pelvic region, vital function instability because there is sympathetic blockade and psychopathology. The technique also fluoroscopy guided and ultrasound guided. In a fluoroscopy guided, the procedure done in a prone position and commonly this procedure is performed by either lateral approach or transdiscal approach. The ultrasound guidance can be done by supine approach, which is more common than that done in prone position. So I will talk about the tech maneuver in the supine position, it mainly used in the diagnostic block at first, or for patient cannot tolerate the prone position. This is the uh, fluoroscopy guidance, prone position, patient in a prone position, and the insertion of needle in lateral approach. It is uh, so difficult for the beginner in pain management because in the way of the needle, there is the iliac crest, and this uh, added more difficulty, and this difficulty may produce more complications. This is the L5 and S1, and this is the plexus, and here the two common iliac vessels. So this is the needle, and we have to insert another needle from the another side. So this is a two needles technique. Here, two needles in a prone position, and in the lateral view, the needles should be just anterior to the anterior aspect of the L5-S1 disc in the lateral view. And we have to confirm the needle position by the injection of a contrast as this appear in front of you. And this is also important because here we have very important structures. Here the L5, L5 important nerve roots for the uh, lumbosacral plexus, and here the S1, and also here the sympathetic chain, and many other structures of importance. So we have to paraplegia or paresis or numbness or other neurological complications. Here in the AP view, you see the inject confirmation of the dye in the front of L5S1, which is uh, in good separate can be followed uh, 
by the uh, chemical and neurolytic agent. Another technique by fluoroscopy is the transdiscal approach. And uh, actually from its name, it is uh, uh, yeah, some, give some sort of uh, possible complications. You know, transdiscal means there is a possibility of discitis and discitis of very, very complicated hazardous complication and difficult to be treated. So better to avoid this technique, even in, in those doing the fluoroscopy guided uh, superior hypogastric plexus block. But uh, honestly, many physicians uh, used to use this uh, technique and I respect their opinion. This is the confirmation of the position of the needle. You see the contrast here in the disc and the contrast here in front of the disc after passing of needle. And here anterior to the disc in the AP view position. And the benefit of this technique, first to avoid insertion of two needles and second to avoid the difficulty of insertion of the needle from the uh, lateral aspect due to a very small area allowing to insertion to insert the needle. The complications of the uh, superior hypogastric plexus under fluoroscopic guidance, injury to the L5 nerve root, the risk of injury to this nerve is higher with the lateral approach, injury to the pelvic viscera in close proximity, bowel and bladder dysfunction due to sympathetic or parasympathetic involvement, inadvertent puncture of the vessels, and uh, this may result in uh, hematoma and also intravascular injection uh, can produce uh, some sort of the uh, spasm to the nearby structure and ischemia I may, may result in hazardous complication. And discitis after a transdiscal approach can be occurred. Placement of the needle too laterally, and this is due to the difficulty of the insertion of the needle, and uh, advancing the needle in this position uh, may lead uh, to a uh, malposition of the needle and the injection of the chemical neurotic agent in the uh, wrong uh, target area. Discitis we talk about, there is potential risk for discitis with the transdiscal approach. However, it is uh, very rare, but it is uh, so hazardous complication and this can be decreased by injection of the cefazolin in one month's saline intradiscally before the withdrawal of the needle. What about the anterior approach? Actually, anterior approach, the patient in the supine position and the needle from the anterior side, anterior posterior insertion of the needle, anterior to the L5, there is two common iliac arteries, and this is the plexus between these two arteries, and the injection of the chemical neurolytic between these two common iliac arteries. This is the abdominal aorta, and this is the bifurcation into two common iliac arteries, this is L5 and this is S1, and the injection will be here in this area. This, this, this is the ultrasonic view. In short axis means the probe and the horizontal axis. This is the vertebrae, and these are the abdominal aorta, and to scan caudally till the bifurcation of the aorta into two common iliac arteries, and then to inject between these two common iliac arteries. We can get the benefit of the color Doppler to see the uh, 
uh, two common iliac vessels here, and this is the target of the injection. This is the needle in a plane and can also be inserted in out of a plane, but better to be in a plane technique. This is the needle and this is the clouding, clouding of the uh, injection of the uh, solution in front of the L5S1. Important points regarding the technique, all the techniques should be under complete aseptic and we have to uh, anesthetize the skin by lidocaine 2%. Since these structures are deep, we have to use 15 centimeter long and 22 gauge chiba needle. We can use both, as I have just mentioned, in a plane or out of a plane. The needle advance till the point of the contact with the fifth lumbar vertebrae. And after that, to be withdrawn one to two millimeter after hitting the vertebra to avoid injecting the drug into the periosteum. 10 mils of 0.25% bupivacaine was used for the diagnostic hypogastric block after confirming a negative aspiration of blood. 10 ml of a solution containing 60% ethanol in 0.25% ibuprofen for the neurotic hypogastric block. The uniform spread of the drug was confirmed under real time sonography. And here I have to say something. For me, for me, in my uh, rules of doing this technique, I actually don't inject chemical neurolytic agent under only ultrasound guidance. Why? Because I want to see the contrast, the spread of the contrast before the injecting of the long acting chemical agent. So I used to insert the needle under ultrasound guidance and inject the local anesthetic under the ultrasound. And if the block successful, and I want to do a chemical neurolysis, I will take two images, AP and lateral, by fluoroscope with the injection of the contrast. And if the separate accepted for me, I will follow this by injecting of the chemical neurolytic agent. Vital signs parameter were recording during and after the procedure, during which the patient remained fully awake to keep contact with the patient. We can use mild sedative, but not the sedation. What are the potential drawbacks of this technique? I mean, the uh, use of ultrasound only without another guidance. Common iliac artery injury, injury to the structures overlying the plexus, such as bowel and bladder. However, pre-procedure bowel and bladder preparation, friendly in bed position, and the smaller size cheap and needle can avoid the visceral injury as collapsed viscera tended to fall away from the needle path. There are no other organs except small bowel loops that lie at the site of needle placement for the block. Infection from the perforating the bowel, maybe. There are chances of injury to the laterally placed lumbosacral plexus and ureter that are at least four to five centimeters away from the anterior most point of the fifth lumbar vertebral body. The anterior ultrasound disadvantages, the anterior ultrasound guided celiac or superior hypogastric. There is lack of absolute confirmation of intravascular uptake. That is to say by the contrast. If some of you mention I aspirate 
I reply, okay, this is good, but it is not enough. Lack of absolute confirmation of the spread of the injected, there is a chances of bowel and urinary bladder injury. The advantages of the anterior ultrasound guided, the anterior ultrasound guided for both celiac and superior hypogastric plexus blood. The technique is safe, less time consuming, and bedside technique. This block is simple to perform, and there is minimal discomfort to the patient as this block is performed in supine position. It also avoids the radiation exposure involved with CT guided and the fluoroscopy guided for the uh, superior hypogastric plexus block. This block can be especially useful in the cancer patient who are having difficulty in lying prone, patient who have intra-abdominal pain, tumor, or conditions that preclude the placement of a posterior needle, such as infection or decubitus ulcer. Patient with ileostomies and colostomies. All of these condition, the patient cannot lie prone, but very easy to lie in the supine position. Also, there is less discomfort associated with the anterior approach. Why? Only one thin needle is used. Furthermore, the needle does not impinge on the periosteum or nerve roots or pass through the bulky paraspinous musculature. Clinical perils, the key to performing ses successful ultrasound guided nerve blow is the ability to properly identify the clinically relevant sonographic anatomy. This should not be a problem if the above technique used. That is to say, for the beginner, don't start with such technique, but to start with the uh, simpler techniques and to strengthen their, their ability to uh, do ultrasound guided interventions and after good level of experience can perform this technique. Any significant pain or sudden increase in the resistance during injection when performing ultrasound guided suggests incorrect needle placement. And one should stop injecting immediately and reassess the position of the needle. Because pain is an important indication of improper needle placement, the practitioner should avoid the use of excessive sedation during ultrasound guided superior hypogastric plexus block. Now, gonna to talk about third topic, which is the uh, Walter impar ganglion block. Uh, the bilateral paravertebral sympathetic chain terminates anteriorly as the midline single fused ganglion called impar ganglion, which supply sympathetic innervation to the perineum. So the celiac plexus is responsible for the most of the abdominal pain, superior hypogastric is responsible for the mostly pelvic pain, and now the impar ganglion responsible for perineal pain. Clinically relevant anatomy, this is the sacrum, which is five sacral vertebrae are fused together to form the uh, sacrum. The bony remnant that are the result of the incomplete fusion of the inferior articular processes of the lower half of S4 and all of the S5 vertebra project downwards on each side of the sacral hiatus. This is the sacral hiatus. These bony projections are called the sacral cornea. These are the sacral cornea, this is one. Uh, lateral view, and this is the sacral hiatus, and this is the sar sarcococcygeal ligament, and the ganglion impart in front of the sarcococcygeal joint. 
This is the sarcococcygeal joint, and this is the ganglion impar, and anterior, just anterior to the ganglion impar, is the rectum. So during this maneuver, one of important precaution to avoid piercing the rectum. The indications of this maneuver, perineal pain, rectal and anal pain, distal urethral pain, vulvodynia, scrotal pain, vaginal pain, distal one tear, prostate and coccidemia. The contraindications, local or systemic infection, coagulopathy, distorted anatomy. The techniques to perform this block, fluoroscopy guided or ultrasound guided. As usual, we will start by few slides for fluoroscopy. Can be performed by lateral approach or intradiscal approach. This is the uh, direction of the needle in the uh, lateral approach to be targeted the anterior aspect of the sarcococcygeal joint. This is the position, patient in a prone position, and this is the transdiscal approach, the direction of the needle from posterior to anterior. This is the needle, passes through the joint, and here the tip anterior to the joint. So here is the ganglion impact. We have to confirm the position and the separate by lateral and AP view. This is the lateral and this is the normal separate actually in the lateral view and AP view. This followed by the injection of the five mil of local anesthetic and for cancer patient can be followed at by the uh, chemical neurolytic agent like phenol. Complications of this technique, in adherent puncture of the rectum, there is a potential risk of rectum puncture, especially if the lateral approach is uh, preferred. Injection of neurolytic agent into the sacra, into, uh, sorry, into the rectum or to nerve in close proximity the uh, risk is again higher in the lateral approach. Neuritis, there is always a risk of neuritis if a neurotic agent is used. Uh, certainly we can use a radio frequency to avoid this risk of neurolysis, neuritis. For the ultrasound guidance, the patient in a prone position and you see here this maneuver that help uh, to relax the two gluteal fold by the uh, direction of the uh, two uh, feet bilaterally. See, this is the normal prone and this is to relax the uh, gluteal muscles, gluteal area. Starting in short access scanning at first by using high frequency linear ultrasound transducer, and we can see the uh, sacrum and to scan caudally to uh, see the two uh, corneal and sacral hiatus. This is the image. Usually, we seek about for during caudal injection. This is the sacral hiatus, and this is the sacrococcygeal ligament. This is the caudal canal, and these are the king down the street. See the similarity between this image and this one. After that, we turn the probe in longitudinal axis, 90 degree, to see the, uh, the, the sac sacrococcygeal ligament, 
on the uh, caudal canal and longitudinal axis. This is the sacrum, and this is the canal, and this is the sacrococcygeal ligament. And this is the end of the sacrum, and this is the coccyx, and here the sarcococcygeal joint. So this is cephalic and this is caudal. After getting this image, nice image, we can insert the needle in out of the plane technique through this joint. Some prefer to use in a plane technique, but for me, it is easier and preferable to use the out of the plane technique. This is the in a plane technique, but can be also used by out of the plane technique. And there is helping maneuver by using loss of resistance technique as the that done uh, for the epidural space when the needle inserted through the ligament, persistent pressure, once the relief of pressure and get loss of resistance means we are now anterior to the sarcococcygeal ligament and we can there inject the uh, chemical local anesthetic and steroid. As the sarcococcygeal joint is penetrated, a pop will be felt. The needle tip should only be advanced just beyond the anterior wall of the sarcococcygeal joint to avoid entering the rectum and contaminating the needle. After gentle aspiration, negative, uh, negative aspiration for cerebrospinal fluid and the blood, 5 ml of solution can be injected. Complications, because of the proximity of ganglion in part to the rectum, make rectal perforation and subsequent tracking of contaminant back through the needle track during the needle removal, distinct possibility. Care must be taken that the needle tip is not placed too deep. Infection and fistula formation, the same cause, Although uncommon infection in the lumbar epidural space can occur, and inadherent dural puncture also can occur. Clinical perils, the key to perform successful ultrasound block is the proper identification of the sonographic anatomy, any significant pain or sudden increase in resistance during injection when performing ultrasound guided Ganglion power block suggests incorrect needle placement, and one should stop injecting immediately and reassess the position of the needle. Because pain is an important indication of improper needle placement, the practitioner should avoid the use of excessive sedation when performing the technique. Now I'm gonna talk about the fourth topic, lumbar sympathetic. We talk about celiac, responsible of most ab abdominal pain, superior hypogastric, pelvic pain, ganglion impar, perineal pain, and now lumbar sympathetic, responsible for lower limb, sympathetically mediated pain. This is the important anatomy in a cross section. This is the lumbar vertebrae, and here the spinous process, here the intervertebral foramen for the nerve root and anterior to the lumbar vertebrae on both sides, anterolateral aspect is the sympathetic chain, our target to be blocked. And if we want to perform this block, our target are three lumbar vertebrae, L2, L3, and L4. Indications, any sympathetically mediated lower limb pain, like complex regional pain syndrome, primary tumor, post amputation, early stump pain, and frostbite. Contraindications, like other maneuvers, the same. Possible complications of lumbar sympathetic block may be classified as neurological complications due to nearby of the number nerves and nerve roots, 
renal and diuretic complications and vascular complications. This is uh, the lumbar sympathetic under fluoroscopic guidance. You see this is AP view and this is lateral view. This is L234 and we see here the tip of the needle at the anterior aspect of the anterior vertebral body. And this is the dye injected and the separate of dye in longitudinal direction. And here also in AP view, the needle not lateral, not so medial in the, uh, our target. This is also the needles and the confirmation by dye injection. And now gonna talk about the ultrasound maneuver. Uh, first, identify the sacrum by a longitudinal axis of the probe, low frequency probe, convex, uh, convex curvilinear probe, because the target is uh, deep. And uh, to see the uh, sacrum as a single bone unit, till appearance of the space between L5 and S1 by the discontinuity of bone. After, after that, we can enumerate the lumbar vertebrae, L5, L4, L3, L2, and to see the spinous process of uh, these vertebrae, and then to scan in the same longitudinal direction laterally to see at first after spinous process the lamina of these vertebrae after that the facet joint and till reaching the transverse processes that give the characteristic appearance of a trident sign this is the uh, trident sign and here we can see this sign in ultrasonic image this is the transverse process, transverse process, transverse process. And here, the, uh, this is the sawas muscle, and this is the lumbar plexus. And here we can find the, uh, actually, the lumbar sympathetic chain. This, we have two techniques, actually. First one, modified intertransverse process, like this one in short axis. We will see this image. This is the spinous process. This is the lamina, intervertebral foramen, psoas muscle, and this is the body of the vertebrae. So from the anatomy, here will be lumbar sympathetic, and here will be lumbar plexus our target, the lumbar sympathetic. So the needle should be targeted this area to perform lumbar sympathetic blockade. And this image, like a sign of waves. So this called wave sign. From this, this is wave sign. Here, another approach by subcostal also called shamrock approach. The patient lie lateral and the probe in short axis, transverse axis, just subcostal. We will see this appearance. This is bunny head sign. This is the transverse process and here the body of the vertebrae. And this is the uh, sawas muscle, and here will be the lumbar sympathetic chain, our target. And the needle inserted from posterior approach towards these three muscles, three muscles. This is the body, and this is the transverse process. Here, the sawas muscle, quadratus lumborum muscle, erector spiny muscle. The target, anterior lateral aspect of the body vertebrae, and the needle from posterior to 
anterior, just like that. This is the direction of the needle. Now we will talk about the last topic, which is the stellate ganglion block. Actually, uh, stellate known as the cervicothoracic or inferior cervical ganglion formed by the fusion of the inferior cervical and first thoracic sympathetic, located on the anterior surface of the longi coli muscle, the longus coli muscle. This muscle lies just anterior to the transversal process of the seven cervical and the first thoracic vertebrae. This is the seventh cervical, and this is the first thoracic and here, the stellate ganglion block. What are the indications of stellate ganglion? In any sympathetically mediated upper limb, neck, or head pain, like complex regional pain syndrome, vascular headache, post herpetic neuralgia, phantom limb pain, neuroplastic disorders, post radiation neuritis intractable angina pectoris, diabetic neuropathy. Long list of indications. Also, in any vascular insufficiency to the upper limb, rhinos disease, rhinos pneumonia, frostbite, vasospasm, occlusive vascular disease, embolic vascular disease, and scleroderma and other indications in hyperhidrosis. The contraindications are local or systemic infection, coagulopathy in asthmatic patient, and uh, because there's a risk of uh, pneumothorax, uh, and in patient with pneumothorax or uh, pneumonectomy on the contralateral side, against the uh, risk of the uh, pneumothorax, and in a recent myocardial infarction. The com possible complications, frequent complications, transient Horner syndrome, actually this denotes a successful block rather than the complication. Recurrent laryngeal nerve block, phrenic nerve block, block of the branches of brachial plexus, and we have serious complication, pneumothorax, inadvertent puncture and injection of the vertebral or carotid arteries, inadvertent epidural or subarachnoid puncture and injection, cardiac emergency like severe hypotension and cardiac dysrhythmias. Rare complication, paratracheal hematoma, inadvertent puncture of the esophagus, osteitis of the transverse process. This is the uh, approach under fluoroscopy guidance targeting the here, as you uh, see, this is the uh, C7, uh, and this is the injection of dye in the lateral view, and here in the AP view. Ultrasound technique of stellate ganglion block. The patient is placed in supine position with the head turned slightly away from the side to be blocked. Turning the head has the uh, dual advantages of increasing distance between the trachea and the carotid artery, also improving the view of the anatomy of the ultrasound imaging. Starting from the C6 at the cricoid pressure, a uh, cricoid cartilage, and then from this scanning laterally. After scanning laterally, we can see this is the trachea, and uh, this is the vertebrae, and this is the actually the C6. How can we know this is C6? Uh, due to the uh, cosinic tubercle, which is most prominent and distinguished sign of the uh, C6, C6, our target to perform this stellate ganglion block. Although sometimes we can do this block at the C7, but with more complication as in the C7, no anterior tubercle. The anterior tubercle actually cover 
and to protect the vertebral artery without anterior tubercle, the vertebral artery will be exposed to injury. This is the longus culli muscle, and this is the carotid artery. This is the thyroid, the carotid artery, the stellate lies anterior to the longus culli muscle and posterior lateral to the carotid artery. So this is the view to be seen before doing the block and the needle will be directed from the uh, lateral to medial, from the anterior to posterior. This is the uh, needle. This is the anterior tubercle and the needle from the lateral to medial. And here, the color Doppler can be used to actually uh, see the uh, nearby vessels and to avoid these vessels. This is the block in the, uh, at the C7 vertebral body. And uh, you see, this is uh, of uh, some danger of the uh, injury to the uh, vertebral artery. So when we use the C7 block, we have to be quite expert to do it without the problem of vertebral artery injury. This is the vertebral artery, and this is the stellate ganglion. And if you ask that the stellate in front of C7, how can we perform the block at C6? The answer that we inject a volume that separate towards C7. So if you ask what's the benefit of doing the block at the C7, the answer will be we can we do this uh, look at this level only when we use radio frequency because the needle of radio frequency affect only the nearby structure. Uh, this is all what I have to say. Thank you very much for your listening, and I will be so happy to hear your comments and questions. Yeah, thank you so much, Professor Sermon. Very wonderful presentation. So uh, next session, we will uh, solve some questions from the audiences, OK? Consider considering the time is a little bit limited. So we just answer maybe three or four questions is enough for us. OK, Dr. Rod, it's your turn. Uh, thank you so much, Professor Ayad for this very nice, very informative presentation. It is not an easy subject to do ultrasound guided sympathetic blocks. So he, is, he must be very, very expert in doing it and in teaching it. And there are many compliments to the presentation to Professor Ayads and many thanks to Wisonic also. And I myself and Again, my friend, Professor Ayad, will thank Wiswanik for very nice, very good opportunity. There are some questions, uh, for sure. Some are repetitive. In addition to the compliments and the thanks, uh, Professor Ayad, some ask, if there is a new pain clinic, what do you prefer? They start with ultrasound or fluoroscope, please. Actually, you know, these are uh, two uh, different techniques, and uh, this belongs to the experience and the training chance, chances for those who open the clinic. So if uh, somebody uh, have got training to start, uh, certainly by ultrasound guided interventions, and to start by the simple interventions, actually we classified the interventions into three levels, basic, moderate, and advanced to get a, a very good training for the 
uh, basic interventions and to start and after getting good experience to transfer to another level till reaching the uh, most sophisticated interventions. And uh, at this level, the uh, physician can think of develop themselves by doing what is called hybrid, both ultrasound and fluoroscopy guided interventions. Thank you so much. Another question, can the ultrasound show the sacral cornea? I think it has been also already during the ganglion empire presentation. Uh, another question about the celiac plexus block. Do you use phenol, alcohol, or local anesthetic? Although you mentioned this already, if you want to add some point, it's okay. Yeah, it is, it is uh, better to, from the scientific point of view, uh, to use uh, actually alcohol, alcohol rather than phenol, because the area yani, filled with the vascular structures, and here the absorption of uh, phenol can uh, make an interaction with the local anesthetic and may add a risk factor for the local anesthetic systemic toxicity. Very nice. And then there is a repetitive question about the visceral injury during the ultrasound injections. Uh, what is the harm of this injury, please? Or what do you suggest? Yeah, and I don't understand the question very well, but if the uh, question means that the injury during the intervention, I mean, the yeah. in, in, inevitable, inevitable injury like the passing of the needle uh, through the stomach to perform the celiac plexus or passes of the needle through the liver to, per liver to perform the plexus, uh, this is of negligible uh, complication and hazards. Well, uh, again, many compliments and many thanks. And from myself, I cannot but praise you for this very nice, very informative presentation. And many thanks to Wisonic and Mr. Odi especially. Uh, I myself got many learning from this very nice and informative presentation. So well, thank you, thank you so much, Professor Ayad. Thank you, Mr. Odi. Okay, okay. So uh, time is up. Thank you so much again for your wonderful presentation, Professor Salman. And thank you so much for your kind assistance, Dr. Rod. Meanwhile, thanks all the audiences for staying with us all the time. So for more information about the Wisonic forthcoming new webinars, or the replay of the previous webinars, please kindly follow Wisonic official account at Facebook, LinkedIn, or YouTube. So thank you and I'll see you next time. Thank you, Dr. Rod and Professor Salman. See you next time. Thank you very much. Okay. Good thank you, thank you very much.